an emerging issue in academia. Um, so, as Renee said, I'm Jessica Mollish, and I am a professor of comparative animal physiology at St. Mary's College of Maryland. I just be in my fifth year at St. Mary's College, so I am the assistant professor, and our college is the National Public Honors College. We're a small liberal arts college that is co-ed and public, even though the name does not necessarily say that. Um, in addition, uh, over the last academic year, I've also taken on an additional role. I am the director of research in epidemiology at our local health department, which it's been a really exciting and rewarding time to jump into the world of applied research and really get to apply some of my skills to uh, this pandemic and an increased need in my local community. Um, a couple things I want to point out. One is that I have opted to share my author line with my 16 phenomenal co-authors for their Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences paper that we published together in July of 2020 that led to this talk. Um, and I'll talk more about them in, in a bit, but this is a group of individuals who met mostly over uh, a shared in interest in gender equity in academia and we found each other largely over Twitter and Facebook. Most of these individuals did not know each other before uh, pulling this paper together. So it was a really, really unique experience um, and one of the few silver linings uh, in the COVID experience. I'd also like to point out that while my title says women scholars during COVID, um, and I, I wanna point out that gender is frequently treated as a binary, which is not the case. We know it's a spectrum and that it's not simply um, a binary. So while I'm be speaking sometimes frequently about women scholars, really, I would hope that most of this applies actually to any gender minority in academia. Um, and gender equity definitely applies to equity across all uh, gender identities. Uh, I have one final thing I also want to make sure I pointed out is that while I might be talking about uh, women scholars or women or individuals who identify as women, um, that there are also many intersectional issues. So there's many different uh, groups that are underrepresented in STEM fields. Many of those intersect with uh, gender and that those individuals tend to be under um, their, the some of the barriers and struggles that they face tend to be amplified um, due to the intersectional nature. So I wanted to highlight that as well. All right, so I was first going to start talking a bit about my history, <laughs> COVID-19 and me. Um, but first, you know, how did I get into academia and what was my path? And so this is me back in 2001 before I went to grad school um, where I spent my time hiking with my dog. Um, but there was a couple of really impactful researchers that I met um, who are individuals um, who really showed me how exciting research, a career in research can be, and that, um, and kind of showed me the path on how to do it. Um, and so, and these were both women that really uh, impacted my career. And so I decided to go to grad school because I realized that I would have to get a PhD if I wanted to pursue a career in research. So I con conducted my PhD from 2002 to 2007 at the University of California, Riverside, studying physiology and particularly ecological and evolutionary physiology. I'm really interested in how organisms uh, live where they live and how that changes over time. I did a postdoc from 2007 to 2010 at the University of Montana, studying ecophysiology of white crowned sparrows that uh, live in Yosemite during the breeding season, focusing on their stress response. Um, and then I was a visiting assistant professor from 2010 to 2016, which is a relatively long period of time to be a visiting assistant professor. Um, but what I want to highlight here is that this is typical of um, individuals that are typically underrepresented in STEM. They tend to spend longer amounts of time and in contingent positions, and this was uh, similar for me. And part of the reason that I opted to stay at Claremont for this duration of time is that throughout my pursuit of a PhD and a postdoc and becoming a visiting assistant professor, I also expanded my family to include my three kiddos. So my eldest, Emmett, was born during my PhD. 
and my middle child Sawyer came along during my postdoc, and then the youngest ranger uh, joined our family when I was a visiting assistant professor. So being a visiting assistant professor really provided me um, the ability to stay engaged in academia and um, research. Luckily, the Carroll Lairmont Colleges did give me some research space and research funds so I could keep that aspect of my academic career up while being a visitor. So I really appreciate that. Um, but I did do that for um, a, about five years. And I also wanted to point out this picture is uh, every year I do research in Yosemite on white crowned sparrows. And every year I take this bunch of kiddos of mine along with me, which definitely presents some additional uh, challenges to pursuing uh, a research career. But it's been um, it's been worth it. So after being a, a visiting assistant professor for, through 2016, I did decide to embark on uh, locating a tenure track position. And I was lucky enough in 2016 to land a position as an assistant professor at St. Mary's College of Maryland. Um, and so that is where I am currently. Now, there were some pre-COVID challenges. Um, I encountered. One is that I do have pretty big research aspirations. I'm very research driven, but I also really adore working with undergrads and mentoring undergraduate researchers and working at a small liberal arts college. St. Mary's College of Maryland is an excellent fit for me, um, but I have these big research aspirations. And I'm out of slack, so we have relatively low internal funds, although I would say St. Mary's College does have good internal funds. Um, compared to other small liberal arts colleges. Teaching load at St. Mary's is typical of a slack. Um, we teach a 3-3 at St. Mary's, so three classes in the fall, three in the spring, uh, but our labs only count as half a class, so we're frequently teaching two full courses and two lab sections to get to that three. And then we're an honors college, which means our Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes are an hour and 10 minutes, and our Tuesday, Thursday classes are an hour and 50 minutes. And so it's really a little bit closer to a 4-4. So we have a pretty heavy teaching load. And we have a service load typical of a small liberal arts college. We're very student-centered, so a decent amount of service. Um, and so these were some challenges I was facing with my big career aspirations. We also are required to have a research program, and so I wanted to um, meet my research aspirations while also dealing with some of the challenges of being a small liberal arts college. And I credit um, the American Association of University Women, as well as Sabina Dillingham, who's shown here on the lower right. She is our director of research and sponsored programs at St. Mary's, and she helped me identify that AAUW would be a wonderful funding source to help me reach my goal of securing an NSF grant. Um, she showed me they have a few different funding opportunities. I really encourage anyone um, and everyone to go look into AAUW to look at what research grants they have available. Um, I secured a year-long fellowship with them that allowed me to have money for childcare uh, so I could work a little bit longer days, um, like full days. <laughs> um, so I had aftercare for my kids. Um, it allowed me to have money to, they actually let me spend the money on bringing my kids to the field station with me where normally I have to, you know, fund that on my own. They gave me research money, course releases, and all of this was to give me time, more time to write um, and secure NSF funding. So that was my solution. So a really wonderful organization that really um, does a great job of empowering women in academia. Um, and so that was a fantastic solution for me to meet my goals. And then, of course, I was awarded that from the 2019 2000 20 academic year and COVID landed right in the middle of this wonderful opportunity. So what happened? Well, that child care that they were paying for ceased to exist. Um, all of my academic work had to go virtual, including the courses that I was still teaching, um, which was an added workload. There was an increase in the amount of mentoring I was having to do to help support students through this trying time and my research students who suddenly had to drop their lab based research projects. Um, there were meetings upon meetings, as I'm sure you all experienced. And um, so obviously, you know, my research time decreased. 
my writing time was decreased. I had this wonderful opportunity from AAUW that was um, getting sidelined by COVID-19. And of course, you know, anxiety has increased. And I, I started to notice throughout social media that there are many people in my situation who were expressing increased anxiety about getting tenure and promotion because of these COVID-induced challenges to their academic careers, particularly pre-tenure individuals with childcare responsibilities. So I reached out to a graduate school friend, Brianna Harris, who, Dr. Brianna Harris, who is a research assistant professor of biological sciences at Texas Tech University. And we have frequently discussed some of the challenges to securing a tenure track position um, and just struggles of being a underrepresented group in STEM fields. And I contacted her to say, are you experiencing some similar things? Are you noticing similar trends? Are you noticing individuals with commonalities to you that are really struggling uh, to get their research and writing needs done during the pandemic? And she said, yes. And we agreed that we needed to do something about it. Um, and so through our connections on social media and people that we had noticed also lamenting similar concerns, we compiled this group of 17 of us total with the ambitious goal of writing a paper that would highlight gender inequity in academia pre-COVID, how COVID had amplified those issues, and most importantly, we wanted to propose solutions, um, knowing that solutions was going to give us the most traction for change. Um, and so to introduce you to these individuals, uh, they're um, doctors from across the country. We have Corinne, Jimena, Jacqueline, Jennifer, Bree, Liz, Christy, Dana, Pump to It, Naima, Jessica, number two, Latha, Stephanie, Shannon, Jessica number three, and Amelia. And so we had a lofty goal of getting this submitted into the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. I knew that was um, a big goal, but luckily I had previously been on a PNAS opinion piece, uh, the Child Care Conference Conundrum, and so I had a little bit of information about who to contact to try and get this um, highlighted, and we were successful. So it was. this is definitely an unexpected silver lining of the pandemic in that I was able to put some time and effort into addressing gender inequity um, in academia, something that had been bothering me for a while, but the recognition that it was getting amplified by COVID did provide this opportunity for us to really get together and work many weekends <laughs> in Zoom calls, in Google Docs to pull together this piece that I'm very proud of. Okay, so yeah, so here's the, the paper in the wake of COVID-19, Academia Needs New Solutions to Ensure Gender Equity. And, and so we've been really pleased. The paper's reached around the world and helped highlight this ongoing and escalating challenges of being a gender minority in academia. Um, and so, like I said, this is just really one of the most rewarding experiences. And so for that, I am grateful. So. That's the background on who I am and how I got involved in the pursuit of gender equity in academia in the time of COVID. So for the rest of my talk, what I wanna talk about is the importance of diversity in academia and that it is a must. Uh, the pre-COVID-19 landscape for women and other gender minorities in academia, so including the leaky pipeline, that it's an uphill climb with a heavier load and then I wanna discuss what COVID-19 has added to that landscape. And then most importantly, what are some solutions? What can we do? So starting out first with diversity in academia. And so I wanna highlight a couple of individuals who have been um, really thinking about these issues before COVID. So this is a paper from 2015. So this is Dr. Hoyer. Um, and she is the executive director at Women in Global Science and Technology. She contributed this paper, Is the Gender Gap Narrowing in Science and Engineering? This was part of an UNESCO science report. And like I said, it came out in 2015. And one of the important things she stated in her paper is that gender equality will encourage new solutions and expand the scope of research. 
It should be considered a priority by all if the global community is serious about reaching the next set of developmental goals. And what I really like about her statement, and I'll come back to some of her research in a minute, but what I really like about the statement is that it highlights the importance of gender e equality, um, not just because it's the ethical thing to do and not just because it's fair, but because it actually, gender equality will encourage new solutions. It will benefit research and academia, will come up with more creative solutions, and it needs to be treated as the priority that it is. A second individual I like to point out is Dr. Burt. Uh, Dr. Burt works at um, Elsevier. She's the executive editor of Strategic Communications. And she published a paper on three reasons gender diversity is crucial to science and why data reveals that the world needs more women in STEM. And she also emphasized that the need for women in science goes beyond the issue of fairness and ethics. Um, our world would be better off with more women in labs, clinics, and clinical trials. And we know that more diverse groups create more creative solutions. And so what I really want to highlight here is the importance of equity for the benefits of having equity and not be focused so much on fairness and ethics and kindness and things like that. But really, equity is an important resource. Gender equity is an important resource to academia, and it needs to be um, prioritized. So Dr. Huyer, this is a figure from her paper, and so this is just an example looking at proportion of individuals who identify as women and individuals who identify as men who are researchers and engineering. And this is a nice global uh, survey, which is nice. So each of those pie charts on the different countries listed, the green indicates researchers, engineering researchers who identify as male versus in purple, which is individuals who identify as female. And so it's very clear and obvious right from this figure that there's um, gender inequity in among researchers in the field of engineering. So it nicely illustrates that um, inequity just based on um, numbers alone. Okay, so hopefully I've emphasized um, that we don't have equity in uh, particularly in STEM fields and that it's an important aspect of the academy. So now I want to discuss some of the pre-COVID-19, um, what the landscape looks like for women in academia and likely other gender minorities, um, pre-COVID-19, taking that out of um, the picture, talking about the leaky pipeline and some of the challenges um, that some individuals in academia face. And so you've probably seen this figure or some version of this figure. And so this graphic, um, it's from the UNESCO report by Dr. Hoyer that I spoke about a few slides back. And what it illustrates is that the leaky pipeline is a global issue for um, women in research positions. And so these numbers are percentages. And so 53% globally of bachelor's degrees are awarded to female candidates. Uh, and that's hold steady for master's graduates. So 53% there too. But female PhD graduates, there's a, a decline of about 10% and in, down to 28% of researchers are female. So what it really illustrates is this leaky pipeline effect. Um, and I'd like to point out that even individuals who are able to secure a tenure track position, um, it's there's the leaks continue at getting tenure and also being promoted to associate in full. And so what I want to say is that academia is going to need more than Band-Aids post-COVID, right? I feel like we've been using Band-Aids to try and triage the leaky pipeline, offering gender-neutral solutions like um, tenure clock extensions, but that's not going to be enough uh, post-COVID with the increased issues that, um, increased challenges that some individuals are facing. Okay, so... In our paper, we list some of the issues that faced women in academia uh, pre-pandemic. And so what we would like to think is that there are these three pillars for in the academy that will get you to tenure, merit, and promotion. And those are teaching, service, and research. Um, 
and depending on your institution, they might be equally weighted um, or they might, you know, there might be different percentages, but we would like to think that all individuals at an institution are feeling equitable um, pressure to perform each of these tasks. But in fact, we know that's not the case. And I'm just picking a few that come to mind. Um, for a more complete list with references, you can visit our my co-author and I's companion website, which is academicequity.smcm.edu, where we've been keeping a list of papers that are coming out about gender equity um, pre and post COVID-19. So there's some great resources there, particularly if you're working on a tenure file and you need some resources to back up some statements, uh, please look there. But here are a non-comprehensive list of some of the challenges and barriers. So. We know that groups underrepresented in STEM also tend to carry, or carry a higher service load, particularly women are asked to carry more service and judge more harshly if they say no. They do more mentoring. Um, in addition to ex general expectations of mentoring, such as mentoring research students or advising for courses and things like that. Individuals from groups underrepresented in, underrepresented in STEM tend to also be assumed to be the go-to person for any students who also um, identify with that group, which increases the mentoring load on those faculty members. We know that women are often given a higher teaching load and that higher teaching load may or may not be apparent, but becomes more apparent if you look at the size of the class. So getting larger classes that are lower level classes, so more 100s and 200s, also being saddled with more non-majors classes, which just creates a heavier service teaching load. Women tend to occupy more contingent positions as well, so they tend to occupy more of them and for a longer period of time. We experience biased teaching evaluations as compared to our uh, colleagues who are not in gender minorities. Uh, we also have biased evaluation by tenure and promotion committees, Oops. Uh, bias in peer review and bias by grant committees. Women have to produce two and a half times as much scholarly work to be judged as equally competent to uh, their male counterparts. Uh, we've received fewer invited speaking positions, so thank you very much for inviting me to this one. And of course, we experience microaggressions and there is the motherhood tax of so things like stopping the tenure clock, which increases your time to um, tenure and leads to a lifelong economic uh, decrease, income decrease. So those are just some of the issues pre-pandemic. Um, so what does COVID-19 add? Well, with the onset of COVID-19, first, you know, there's the switch to online teaching, which you would think would be um, a gender neutral um, load, but we know like if you're teaching larger classes that are lower level, um, or non-majors, that is a, a more challenging environment than if you have, you know, senior level students in a smaller class that you have a, a you know, more one-on-one -on -one rapport with already when you switch to online teaching. Also just, you know, if you have a bigger class, that's just more emails, you're getting more students struggling to make that transition. So it is an increase in load for class management for sure. Um, if you were already advising or had heavier mentorship responsibilities, those only increased when that all shifted to online and those students who may be higher needs had even more of a challenge coping with the switch to online. If you had dependents that are suddenly at home, of course, homeschooling children or more likely, you know, facilitating their switch to online learning is a really challenging task. And although we know that anyone who would be in charge of caring for uh, or doing dependent care would all be impacted, we also know that um, men are more likely to have a stay-at-home spouse than women, and so this will disproportionately impact uh, women with careers in academia. Right, and so, you know, initially, 
when the pandemic first started, there was a lot of anecdotal um, comments showing up in places like Twitter and whatnot about um, the toll that COVID-19 was taking on women in academia. There was anecdotal comments from journal editors saying they were seeing fewer submissions by women and more from men. Um, but as the months have passed, data-driven papers are providing more hard evidence um, that we suspected early on. And I think as time goes on, we'll really see the ramifications of this pandemic and what it's done to productivity in different um, groups in academia over time. So for example, Collins et al., they examined the number of hours worked and they found that mothers with young children had reduced their work hours four to five times more than fathers. Consequently, the gender gap in work hours has grown by 20 to 50 percent, which is alarming. Um, in addition, in another paper that came out in 2020 in Gender, Race and Parenthood Impact Academic Productivity During the COVID-19 Pandemic, um, they found that male academics, especially childless ones, were the least affected group, whereas female academics, particularly black women and mothers, were the most impacted group. So I'm seeing that um, amplified effect of intersectionality. For me, <laughs> and we put this in the paper, what I found most alarming was that to make matters worse, in times of stress, such as pandemics, biased decision-making processes are favored, which really threaten to deprioritize equity initiatives. So what alarmed me the most was that equity initiatives that don't get the focus they should anyway were going to be deprioritized at a time when there was an emerging equity um, crisis that was exactly when equity initiatives might be pushed to the side, something to think about later, without realizing that those decisions are gonna have ramifications for the academy, for diversity in the academy for decades. And I was most concerned about what is being done to make sure that individuals who are already in danger of falling from the leaky pipeline at tenure and promotion, what's being done to make sure that doesn't happen? And I started asking around and I was alarmed to find out that it wasn't the focus. It wasn't the focus. The groups that were focusing on pandemic related issues were focusing on other things, switching to online classes. How are we gonna budgetarily make ends meet if students stop coming to college because we're online, things like that. But gender, or yeah, gender equity was not one of the things being considered. So I felt really motivated to write this paper. And so I wanted to quote Dr. Escalon, who wrote a great piece for the New York Times, Women in Academia, Academia Face a New Burden. And she said, I hope the administration realizes that anything they do now to alleviate this issue for caregivers will directly impact how the professorate will look five to 10 years from now, how diverse it will be, and how many women will be in positions of power within academia. And one thing I really want to point out, too, is you know her point here about women in positions of power, if the main solution that's provided for coping with this pandemic is a tenure clock extension, that is going to decrease the number of women in positions of power. It will delay the time for them to get there, and it will also impact them economically for um, the rest of their career. Um, and so, and I like that she points out that the administration really needs to realize that this is an impact worth being concerned about. Okay, so on to the meat of this. So what are these solutions? And I want to quote Dr. Manello, who published a paper in Nature very early on in the pandemic. It was the pandemic of the female academic. And her quote that I just love and I think is correct to the core is that the only real solution is the classic one, a long-term investment in gender equality, right? So we need to make this a priority. And it's one we've known but haven't prioritized enough. And so it needs to be a long-term investment, not a Band-Aid solution. So. I would say that step one is that academia needs to admit that there is a problem. Um, institutions need to evaluate gender inequities in service. They need to really look at 
<clears throat> not only if we make a list of all of the service responsibilities, does everyone have the same number, but really what is the load? What is the service load in those? How many students are being served? What's the need level of those of those services and is that equally distributed and are we giving appropriate compensation for individuals who are working to improve gender equity in academia and to support students who are um, minority groups in academia institutions need to evaluate gender inequities in teaching and taking a really thorough fine tooth comb to that you know giving more credit for classes, larger classes, giving more credit for uh, non-majors courses and courses that are taught to first and second year students, like really evaluating, um, are we equitably distributing this teaching load to all members of our faculty? I would also, I guess, would also add in there, how many new course preps are you asking of, of your faculty members and is that equitably distributed? They need to evaluate gender inequities in research. Are all of the same resources being uh, equitably allotted to their faculty members? Do people have equal access to research funds, to lab space, um, to RAs, undergraduate funds, things like that? And definitely evaluate gender inequities in salary. Um, we know that certain groups get paid on average less than other groups. Um, and now's the time to really make sure that that doesn't that gap doesn't get wider with any sort of knee jerk solutions to dealing with budgetary restraints at the institution level. So after. All of these metrics have been evaluated. Institutions need to develop goals and action plans to eliminate these disparities. And one thing I really want to um, highlight that I think is important is decide what that goal is. And I would say the knee jerk gut thought is probably parity would be the goal, right? Equal. But if you do the research and you look, we know certain things like um, groups that are um, underrepresented in STEM fields, they tend to not be heard unless they're the, actually the majority. So maybe parity isn't your goal. Maybe you do want to have more of specific, of certain groups um, among your faculty members. Maybe parity is not enough to actually make voices be heard. So asking hard questions like that. And then, right, what does, what does our action plan, what does it mean? How are we going to get there? How are we going to eliminate these disparities? And there might be opportunities now because academia is getting reworked in different ways because of this pandemic, maybe this is an opportunity to um, really develop these goals and an action plan to eliminate disparities. So that's step one. And I just wanted to share this um, example that I found on Twitter of someone sharing the PNAS paper and saying that there's no better time to start to rethink some of the system systematic inequalities that women face in academia. Any promotion and tenure process that does not account for these issues, especially now, sets promising faculty up for failure. And I just like that they're pointing out, you know, we don't want to lose these resources. Um, we need to take this seriously, particularly at the promotion and tenure level that um, we're accounting for systemic inequalities in academia. So step two is we need to triage the impacts of COVID-19 on women um, and, and anyone, you know, who is disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And so I would suggest an adjustment of expectations for tenure and promotion. I would not suggest, I think having the option for individuals to extend their tenure clock if they so choose, if they are knowledgeable about what that means, about amount of time it's going to take them to get to a position of power at their institution, what that means economically over the long term. Um, but that shouldn't really be a blanket solution. And we know gender neutral solutions are, have not worked out to improve gender equity. So I would say adjust the expectations for tenure and promotion. Don't slow these individuals down. Um, provide resources that facilitate a research rebound. Um, this could be summer salary. It could be research funds. 
a postdoc or graduate student funds, I would emphasize perhaps course releases if it turns out that some individuals in your faculty are carrying a heavier teaching load and therefore were really more in one that they were already impacted and impacted even more when COVID hit and courses went online. Um, and so those individuals, perhaps they have earned a course release to compensate for this added uh, burden. Compensation for childcare costs is huge. The AAUW fellowship that provided me funds to cover childcare and pay, just pay for aftercare was um, an enormous help in keeping my research program on track. Um, so in our paper, we proposed the establishment of a pandemic faculty merit committee. And we emphasize that this committee should be diverse. It needs to include the individuals who are being impacted. So um, that should include women, uh, other gender minorities, faculty of color. That group needs to be informed and understand the inequality and in inequity at their institutions. It needs to be transparent and detailed plans to promote gender equity and race parity. They need to be pre pre uh, proactive, distribute a clear and documented procedure for evaluation and reevaluation, and they need to be trained. They need to really understand how COVID-19 differentially impacts the careers of certain groups. Um, and we actually, in addition to this being a figure from the PNAS paper that has some of the starting point for the honest conversation, asking the right questions, um, at academicequity.smcm.edu, and as well as in the PNAS paper as a companion um, piece, we have a document that lists a number of questions that these committees can ask individuals to really understand how COVID-19 has impacted them and find ways to address those um, impacts and triage uh, the impacts this has taken to individuals' uh, research and other productivity. And then step three is to reevaluate the more is more expectation that we have built in the academy. Um, most of my solutions are focusing on tenure and promotion. Um, for me, that was what I was most concerned about when the academic happened, when I started seeing um, individuals in academia starting to get concerned about if they were going to get tenure and promotion because they weren't able to get enough writing and research done uh, during the pandemic. <clears throat> so most of mine focuses more at like the individual institution level and what do individual institutions administration need to do to support faculty going up for tenure and promotion. This is more, this is more broad. This extends more to the academy to reevaluate the more is more expectation. Dr. Gibson and colleagues put this out last year um, in 2020, and it's about how to support early career researchers. So, uh, and to reset science in the post COVID-19 world. So like I've been mentioning earlier, using this as a springboard to really change how we um, address and prioritize equity and gender equity in academia. Um, yeah, but this paper is a great resource for just discussing broader issues of the excessive demands of academia. Um, and so with that, I just wanna close with uh, this quote from the paper that I really like, which is to affect real change, it's necessary to change how the academy thinks about gender equity and equity for all academics. And I want to acknowledge some very empowering mentors that I have had um, throughout my career. We know that uh, women are more likely to be retained with strong female leadership and mentorship. And so these are some of the women who have really supported me throughout my career. Um, starting with the top left, Dr. Kriya Bruner. She was my postdoc advisor and continues to be an amazing research mentor and showed me how to conduct field, re field research with children in tow. Uh, Dr. Eileen Bailey is my current department chair in the Department of Biology at St. Mary's College of Maryland and always a wealth of support and information about being an academic and a woman in academia. Dr. Miriam Priest was my department chair while I was a visitor at the Claremont Colleges and she really helped facilitate. Um, she helped me develop skills and my CV and whatnot and prepare for interviews on the tenure track. Dr. Katherine Gantz is the Associate Dean at St. Mary's College of Maryland and has provided 
um, really impactful mentorship during my time here at St. Mary's. And then finally, Dr. Mina Brewster, who is the individual who reached out and provided me this fantastic opportunity to work with my local health department and apply my research skills to help my community deal with this pandemic crisis. So with that, I am happy to take any questions or discuss anything that I mentioned in my talk. Well, I just want to say thank you so much. We greatly appreciate that. Um, and at this time, I, as she said, we'll go ahead and open this up to questions if people want to kind of either put them in the chat or use the little raise hand. Um, I think that would be the easiest way to go about this. Okay, um, I see we have uh, Thomas Edinger. If you want to go ahead and ask a question. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I like your su potential suggestions and solutions. I'm curious why, unless I missed it, you seemingly skipped over sort of leveling the playing field. If in fact, minority instructors, faculty, researchers are given more teaching in lower division courses, if they're given more service work, if they're giving uh, a greater expectation workload, it seems that that should be the first place to start. Why don't, why don't we level the field? Why don't we give these individuals the same requirements of everyone else? Yeah, that's a really great point. And I think I, I felt like I had said that, but maybe I wasn't clear about that where I just listed, you know, like step one is we have to acknowledge this is a problem because in my experience, I've I'll, you know, say, um, hey, I've noticed that we have more junior women teaching our introductory courses, our larger courses, you know, things like that. And I'm told, no, 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 it's all equal. So what my point was, like, we have to actually acknowledge that this is happening. And that needs to be like a thorough investigation, right? So the institutions need to look at that and yes, and then enact, you know, and then level the playing field. So yes, I should have put that on the slide, um, but I was, I was implying it, like really recognize that these issues are there because I think right now it's easy to gloss over and say, oh, it's not, you know, it's not that big a deal. And maybe individuals were able to lean in and do a little bit more and it, was doable before the pandemic. It's not anymore. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, thanks for pointing that out. I'm gonna make that more clear if I give this talk again. Okay, I see a few more. Um, okay, so we'll start with um, Astrida, if you want to go ahead. Thank you. Sorry, I had to get the dog out of the room. <laughs> it's not bark. <laughs> um, what, Rick, and Thank you for some of the references. I was in the car um, for part of the presentation, but what recommendations do you have for surveys that are done of faculty during this time to kind of document the current state to help have it be effective information that can be used now and in the future? Yeah, so what I put on our, um, on, as it's, I guess it's like an appendix to the PNAS paper. We actually put together like, I think it's a two or three page list of potential questions that an institution could use to pick which ones apply to them, that they could use to sort of assess, like to make sure the right questions are being asked. And I'm sure there's more, you know, but it was just like certain things that we are coming up with um, as a group, things that we wanted to um, highlight. And so that list exists um, and, 
we suggested, um, <laughs> I, I have, I have someone visiting me in my room. Um, <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so did someone put it up on there? Thanks. Um, so I would, yeah, I would direct you to that, that list of questions and then tailor it to your institution because some are going to matter more than others. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, Dr. Borg, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Sure. All right. uh, I was curious about your recommendations with regard to uh, to P and T. Um, so last year, Marquette did a, an extension of the tenure clock for faculty. And that was kind of across the board. You could volunteer or not volunteer. But you, you spoke. I think there was a couple of points that you that you mentioned. And one of them was was it was it around changing the criteria and how how we might do that? Could you talk more about that? Yeah, one way would be to just allow people to instead of extending the ten year clock, just recalibrate the expectations. So instead of you're expected to do X, Y, and Z in six years, how about you're expected to do X and Y in you know, a shorter period of time or, or the, you know, the complete time, but you don't really count that pandemic year, almost like they were given a 10 year clock extension, but you aren't extending it. You're just decreasing the number of pubs required. You know, you just, just so that it doesn't slow people down, right? They can just continue on their tenure track, um, but we acknowledge that there was an interruption. And the reason that I think that's preferable to a 10 year clock extension is, um, you know, like, it's a financial issue, right? With tenure, you get a raise. And so if you take a one year delay to get to that raise, that's less you're contributing to your retirement for the rest of your career, right? And so it actually has a pretty long term impact. And when we already have paid disparities, that's going to amplify it for individuals who took that option. And because we know this burden is falling more, it's, it's falling inequitably, inequitably to certain groups that group already has a pay gap, and so it's going to amplify it. And so it it might do some benefits in keeping people, retaining people in tenure and promotion, but it's not gonna help with a pay gap, and it's not gonna help with um, getting individuals into positions of power where their voices can be more, are more heard. Sure, okay, that, that's what I thought I heard, so yeah, thanks. Okay, um, let's see, we'll have uh, Dr. Stewart, if you want to go ahead. Thank you, Renee. Thanks, Jessica. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation, so thank you very much. I had a question you mentioned in step one. Uh, the first step is to admit or acknowledge that there is a problem. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on what kind of conversations one has to get that recognition on the table. Uh, so I can imagine they could be at multiple different levels. I mean, at the department chair level, colleague department chair level, all the way up to the provost um, of an institution. So any tips or any experiences that you've had, how do you increase awareness and increase recognition that some changes have to happen or analysis at least has to happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I would recommend that it happens right at the level of the administration um, where an analysis of the number, perhaps, you know, like looking at different metrics. And I guess the reason I would say like it needs to be at the administration level because it removes some of the sort of internal potential bias of any individual departments. Um, so looking at things like for just establishing institution specific metrics that are, you know, um, quanti trying to quantify teaching load in a different way, you know, than has been done. And really, you know, looking to see, to evaluate, is it equitable? And I think, um, the assumptions are frequently it's equitable enough, <laughs> um, but it might not be. And another good way to do that actually would be like anonymous surveys, particularly of individuals in the groups you're concerned about. Like, do they feel it's equitable? Because I know in my own experience, you know, I felt 
that my service teaching load is pretty high. Um, and I've mentioned that to other individuals and I'm told, oh, no, no, it's fine. But of course, these are the individuals who are teaching, you know. Um, I've also been told things like, um, you know, I had the microaggressions listed on the slide. I've been told it's a good thing you teach all those intro classes because I don't have the patience. And it's like, well, I was assigned them and it wasn't based on any uh, evaluation of my patience level, but like the assumption that I am more patient and therefore I should be teaching these um, courses that require more of a one-on-one um, -on -one and methodical slow approach with students. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sontag. Hi, yes, uh, thank you so much. The talk was great. Um, and I guess my question is very much related to Rosemary's question of just if you find yourself in one of these situations, do you have any tips or any resources to become a better self advocate um, and sort of put yourself out there? Because I know that's difficult for me and I know it's difficult for a lot of other minorities in science as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really is. I think having, um, for me, I've been really lucky in that, you know, one of the people I acknowledged is the associate dean of faculty at our college who has been a wonderful mentor and someone to like kind of ask those questions like what are our institutional norms what is the best way to navigate this what is the best evidence for me to supply within this institution um, to make um, progress here but i do think like one thing that is very helpful is just to be able to document um, documentation is important um, one thing that's been useful, like I'm not an economist, but we have I have colleagues who are economists, you know, who who we, I have discussed with them like, hey, how do we I've you know discussed with one on campus. How do we calculate a workload metric for teaching these classes and can we get this data and can we show, you know, within our institution if this is equitable or not? Because um, data speaks, right? So um, I think providing evidence either in your own data set or if you can find um, resources that back it up. And we've been, the co authors and I have been working really hard on that academic equity website to try and keep putting resources up there to help individuals out. Um, and that is, you know, a good thing for junior faculty advice i would give senior faculty um, if you are approached by junior faculty asking for advice <laughs> that you listen to them and believe them um, don't tell them no 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 it's fine <laughs> like actually help them navigate that situation for retention's sake thank you you're welcome okay almost done Well, it looks like we have just a few moments left. If anyone else has any other questions, um, I just once again want to thank you so much for speaking to us today. I think there was a lot of great information in there. Um, and then I see a follow up question to the last one. When you say keep documentation, do you keep that on your own for your private record or should that documentation be in a shared or formal place? Mm, that is a good question. I always document those sort of things for myself um, in an own, my own personal file. And then if there is, you know, like I've discussed um, working with another colleague on campus to work on the, you know, can we quantify teaching load in a different way than the college currently knows. Like ours, ours is very much like a class is a class. Um, and so can we quantify that in a different way and attribute, you know, different uh, metrics to the actual workload associated with different types of courses? Um, if we get that together, that would be something that we would plan to share with the provost or any, you know, we're a smaller institution, so it's relatively easy for us to go direct to the provost with concerns, which is a benefit of small liberal arts college. Um, but if there were a, if you have a vice, pres vice president of equity or, a, you know, a, some sort of administrator involved with equity, that would be a good person to share it with as well. Okay. 
okay. Um, <laughs> well, I, like I was saying again, thank you. We really appreciate it. Um, and we really appreciate all of you attending today. Um, the the advance office will be I'll be sending out a follow up evaluation, which is important for us as well as feedback for Jessica on her talk. And then I will link to the article that she referenced in this a bunch. I realize that was not linked in the event information. Um, so on that, I hope that everyone has a good afternoon and thank you again for for speaking to us today. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you very much. Wait, isn't over? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. And I look forward to the survey. Yeah, I will um, forward that along to you. So thank, I, I think that went well. We had some questions from people from our advanced team and then people in other departments. So yeah, those um, are really good questions. I wish I had more answers for the how to do the admin side of things. I think it's stuff that we're having conversations on and everybody is. So. Yeah. Well, that's great. I'm glad you all are having that conversation. Yeah. Well, thank you and thank you yeah. so much and I will be in touch. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Thanks. Bye. Bye.